So first, I okay. talk for a minute about the historiography. About this is the this is considered by by a lot of people as the go-to biography on the and it's by Robert Service. And so I want to talk about the historiography there for a minute, and then um, and then talk about how this presentation shaped up, and then. Um, explain from the outset kind of, uh, I think, the angle I'll be taking on Lenin. And then, and then I'll just pick up where, where we left off last week. Um, and then we'll go through the presentation. So, um, so like I said, this is kind of the, the go-to biography on, on Lenin. Um, I was, uh, I felt like, um, so it's hard to find um, biographies of Lenin, Stalin, etc., from Western um, historians that don't uh, that aren't riddled with a lot of fundamental assumptions underlying their historiography. And um, for me, these assumptions took the form of um, a double standard that service applies <clears throat> throughout. And what I mean by that is. Um, as he describes like the, the Romanov dynasty and the Tsarist Russia, um, he always go. He's always at, at great lengths to kind of um, just describe that time period as very matter of factly, uh, even though uh, countless um, people are marginalized and oppressed and um, uh, killed or starving, what, whatever the case may be, depending on the particular time in that dynasty. Um, regardless of the fact that they don't have the vote, <clears throat> service is, very, is presenting this very matter-of-factly. Yet when he describes um, the policies that Lenin undertakes after the Tsar is ousted, um, he kind of reserves all of his, uh, you know, his vitriolic um, descriptions from Lenin. And so <clears throat> that's the first point of contention, I, I think. Um, and the second is, is that he kind of continually uh, sees kind of sinister motives behind Lenin's uh, actions. And there are a lot of areas where he, uh, where I disagree with service, and I'll kind of hit them as we go along. And things that service might critique Lenin for, um, I actually would myself praise Lenin for, but we'll, uh, I'll try and hit this as we go along. Um, so if you're trying to find like historiography on Soviet leaders in Soviet history, um, read the brain of salt, I guess. Um, and if you guys have any recommendations for me afterwards, that'd be great. But um, <clears throat> he also has what's kind of seen in the industry as one of the go-to biographies on uh, Stalin and also on Trotsky, which Chris just sent me a link to in the interview about his Trotsky biography. Um, but, I th but just, you know, for my kind of personal worthless recommendation, I probably will not be reading his Stalin and Trotsky biographies. We'll probably try and find them from a different source. So, uh, yes. so if you're looking for a biography, keep that in mind as he, um, <coughs> as he writes. Um, so one of the reasons this was so frustrating to me was because um, as, I'm, as I'm reading about the life of Lenin and all of his actions, um, I can I can always kind of see at least two sides to um, <clears throat> to his actions, and probably that's just because of the nature of this we're a non-tendency group, and so I'm trying to keep that in mind as I'm preparing this presentation. Um, and service kind of doesn't <laughs> fails to see multiple angles to Lenin's motivations at times, and um, instead of referring to primary documents, he kind of um, inserts his own commentary a lot of the time. Or I felt like too often, so. This was personally frustrating to me because I um, it took me a long time to go and kind of um, kind of double check claims the service was making uh, against primary documents, um, <clears throat> and so for that reason, um, I'm going to focus today on the formation of Lenin and the um, and the party. So we left off last time, at, and I'm. I'm and then Greg was really nice and nice enough to offer to do Leninism. So I think he'll be talking. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. Talking more about um, Lenin's involvement in the party. Probably you'll probably be filling in a lot of the information that I'm not going to get to because I'm going to focus on Lenin's formation of the party. If I remember correctly, he left off on his exile. Uh -huh. His first exile. Yes. So he gets he gets exiled, 
and um, <clears throat> he's in Siberia, Italy, and um, he comes back after a few years, his exile ends, around 1900 he comes back, and um, one of the criticisms that fellow Marxists had made of Lenin, his friends, even those Marxists that he admired, was that he hadn't traveled abroad yet. Um, even in exile, it was in Siberia. Um, and the reason they make this criticism is because uh, Lenin uh, makes the case that capitalism has arrived in full force in Russia at the time, around 1900. And, um, and, this, and this has implications because he then will go on to argue that we can start the next stage of the revolution. And a lot of his Marxist friends accuse him of kind of overselling the argument that if capitalism has arrived in full force. Um, and they, they encourage him to go to London and to, to the, the major European cities and to see the factories and to see that uh, Russia is still uh, behind its counterparts in Western Europe. And so he uh, comes back from um, being banished. Uh, he, I, I think I mentioned last time he got, he got married while he was out there to another revolutionary, um, Nadia. And uh, anyway, they come back and, and they travel. <clears throat> and he lives outside of the Russian Empire now for about five years. And while he's outside of the Russian Empire, um, he, in 1898, uh, the first Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party is formed. Uh, Lenin is not yet involved in this. And it is formed by a guy named Strove. And again, I'm just, I'm just going to slaughter all these names today. So you guys are going to have to be patient with me. But so uh, uh, it's commissioned by Strove. <coughs> Strove is a, um, at the time of this Congress, is a Marxist. Later, he'll be a lapsed Marxist and um, uh, migrates over to the liberal camp and uh, later joins the white movement against the Bolshevik Revolution. But at this time, he's a Marxist. He forms the first Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, 1898. Um, Lenin is, is in exile at that time. And he barely gets off the ground. It's very short-lived. All the participants except one are arrested within a few weeks. So a functioning party is yet to be established for, uh, for revolutionaries in, in Russia. So Lenin gets back, and he feels like this is the primary task of revolutionaries in Russia is to, uh, one, set up a, a, a functioning newspaper, and two, to set up uh, the second Congress and to get a party up and running. And um, <clears throat> so he, uh, he meets and collaborates with Plankanov, and Plankanov, I think I mentioned it briefly last time, he is considered the first uh, Russian Marxist um, responsible for disseminating a lot of Marxism throughout the empire. Um, and he's, so he's seen as um, this kind of almost untouchable authority figure on Marxism in Russia. Uh, Lenin admires him greatly and goes to meet him. And they make plans to set up a newspaper um, <clears throat> and a party. And they, they do just that. <clears throat> they set up the Second Party Congress, um, uh, March of 1902. Um, a lot of these guys uh, are immigrants right now, like uh, Lenin, Plankanov, etc. They're not living in the Russian Empire, but, um, mostly because they have uh, police documents in there. They they feel like they can't go back home without being arrested. Um, so they're setting this up kind of um, uh, almost in absentia. They're setting it up outside of the <coughs> the uh, Russian Empire, and. Um, I set up the Second Party Congress, 1902. And they first they form an organizational committee for the Congress. And I'll kind of go over the kind of nuts and bolts here, um, because I think these are actually useful for how they kind of proceed from points A to Z. Uh, they set up an organizational committee for the Congress. And it was this committee that was responsible for um, choosing delegates from various quarters uh, of the Russian Empire and throughout Europe. Um, and so this was kind of a laborious task, and it was very controversial. And it was a lot of like um, networking and coordinating and letter writing, and they were writing in code um, for fear of being arrested. And um, 
and they're riding all over Europe and all over Russia, <clears throat> trying to decide who, um, you know, which which revolutionary groups are going to be allowed to send delegates. And if and remember, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of factions at this time, and um, the old agrarian socialist tendency in Russia that was very prominent in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s is um, slowly fading out of popularity as um, uh, Marxist numbers are growing. And some of the major points of discontent between the two groups um, is, is um, uh, the agrarian socialists um, seem to have an affinity towards the peasants. The Marxists seem to um, these are blanket statements. There's disagreements even with these two camps, but generally, the Marxists um, believe that uh, industrial working classes will have to lead uh, the revolution. And then also, there's the there's the issue of violence. And the agrarian socialists are known for um, successful and unsuccessful assassinations of various leaders, um, high-profile bombings, and a lot of and a lot of times they're unsuccessful, but sometimes they do succeed at their aims. <clears throat> and many of the Marxists feel like um, these covert violent actions uh, will be counterproductive and that they need to organize as a large uh, class, set up a party, and, um, and organize that way. And so there's kind of, there's kind of disputes about this. Um, Lenin obviously considers himself an uh, orthodox Marxist, but he has um, <clears throat> He has a lot of respect for a lot of the agrarian socialists and for their um, their tactics of, of terror, and I'll get into that later as well. He um, that becomes a source of controversy throughout his career. Um, critics use that against him. Uh, sometimes he tones that down, and sometimes he uh, uh, whips that up in his speech. But he seems to have uh, a, a, a deep respect for those uh, those so-called those terrorists. Uh, let me see here. So we've got the first party, the second Congress. So as the second Congress meets, there's a Jewish Bund, and they may be the largest uh, revolutionary faction in the empire. And um, they feel like their numbers are not representative of the Congress. There's also a Geneva newspaper, The Workers' Cause. Um, which feels like the working class is not giving, being given enough of a, a leadership role in the Second Congress. And so as the Second Congress convenes, um, there's walkouts, um, there's almost a fist fight. Lenin has to pull someone aside and say that fist fighting is for people who can't make uh, well-formed arguments. Um, and also, in leading up to the Second Party Congress, <coughs> Lenin and Plekhanov are trying to um, um, well, they're trying to have as much influence as possible on the, del on the delegates that are chosen for the Second Party Congress. When the Second Party Congress convenes, Lenin is actually censored for this by the Congress. Um, Plekhanov is not because he's kind of seen as this um, this figure beyond reproach. Actually, there's a motion to censor Lenin. And, uh, Actually, it almost passes. It doesn't pass, so he's not actually censored. Um, and so, I thought this might be an interesting point of departure for us: is we're a non-tendency group, and uh, I think I think uh, well, and Greg's made um, uh, what would you call that? Like a an outline for or a call for for the the new party? Mm -hmm. uh, a draft resolution is actually yeah. yeah. And so, so we're so we're a non-tendency party here, and um, there were a lot of mixed emotions at this first at this second party congress, and a lot of people felt like, well, Lenin and Plekhanov did all the work to arrange this. So of course, when the congress begins, they're going to dominate the congress. They're going to have um, they have a um, a draft party program already written up, to which people can vote on, um, and they've worked. Um, to try and nominate the delegates that they want to come to this event. Um, <clears throat> and so on the one hand, a lot of people feel like, well, they did a lot of the work. Of, of course, this is kind of a natural um, conclusion. Others, like I said, there were walkouts. And some people felt like it wasn't um, democratic enough from the get-go. Um, 
and so Leonard is almost censored. Um, and, and then I'll also, I'm going to take a minute here and kind of talk about the angle I'm going to take about Leonard. Um, I want to resituate the debate um, on Lenin through this presentation. Um, I think that tying in with the, the, the comments on historiography that I opened with, um, in my opinion, um, Lenin, as he's forming the party, um, is really kind of no more or no less guilty of politicking in the way that many of our American beloved political leaders are, from Kennedy to FDR to Lincoln. Yet, I think in the historiography, he's kind of presented as this very selfish, manipulative um, person that um, when it seems to be like over and over again, he kind of does uh, what is really standard for politics at the time. And this can be a point of departure, again, for a conversation of um, in, you know, 2010, what kind of um, politicking do we um, ascribe to now? But as far as uh, Lenin in 1900, 1917, um, there weren't any moments in his forming of the party where I felt like he was, like I said, any more or less guilty than um, what is generally ascribed to be the business of politicking. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. For instance, just to give you one aside, he um, he has a lot of his family. His his family is extremely supportive of him and of his cause. And he has a lot of his family members uh, as delegates or as uh, positions like, uh, around him. And um, service takes him to task for this. And I remember thinking at the time, it sounded to me like a lot like uh, the Kennedy administration, actually. And I wondered if service would take the Kennedy administration to task for the same tactics of uh, surrounding yourself with people that you felt like you could work with cooperatively and productively. And, and, um, that you felt like were smart and loyal and uh, shared your views on politics. And it seems to me that Lenin is really never guilty of more than that in his informing the party. Um, the second party congress, uh, I think I said this already, meets in, in Brussels, 1903. They immediately had to move to London, though, when they uh, encountered uh, trouble from the law. Uh, they meet five days later in London in a uh, chapel run by a socialist uh, reverend, and this and uh, Lenin apparently has to quote conquer his distaste for meeting in a church building, um, and this is something that Lenin will um, struggle with throughout his life. Um, he he later uh, he later meets a. Uh, He later meets a, a revolutionary priest that he admires very much and, and writes about him. But, it, and, um, but at times he has a hard time like curtailing his, dis, his disgust for the merging of religion or faith and uh, socialism. And um, I, personally, I can sympathize with that. Um, but he, he, he constantly works on that, and he wants to reevaluate that, and he wants to um, to try and make that a principled stand rather than just a kind of a petty stand. Um, at the Second Party Congress, Plankanov, at the time that Lenin was about to be censored, Plankanov is requested by party delegates to denounce Lenin and to renounce Lenin. And behind the scenes, not a lot of people know this at the time, but Plankanov and Lenin have been fighting a lot. And uh, they have various disagreements. And Lenin goes and comes to Plankanov and tells him that uh, Lenin has a case of what they called nerves at the time throughout his life and suffers several, what we call today probably, um, uh, breakdowns. Um, and he goes to Plankanov and he says, that, you know, this is killing me. Like, we keep fighting and I keep having these nervous breakdowns. And, and uh, apparently, Plankanov is unsympathetic. And then later, Plankanov comes to Lenin and tells him that he's had suicidal thoughts because of their fighting, and at that time, now Lenin is unsympathetic. And, um, so they seem to have this, uh, this relationship that is very personal, and there's a lot of infighting. And Plankanov is asked to denounce Lenin, 
at the Congress. And um, Plekadal makes this really emotional, rousing speech um, where he refers to his relationship with Lenin as a marriage, actually, and it surprises Lenin. Um, and Plekadal tells this story about Napoleon, and he says, Napoleon uh, asked his officers to divorce their wives, even though they loved their wives very much, perhaps. Um, he asked them to divorce them and to uh, devote themselves to the task at hand, and he said, but I will never divorce Lenin. So they, they tried to present a united front uh, to the party. Uh, this will become even more strained, their relationship as time goes on, though. Um, so the Jewish Bund walks out, Bund walks out of the Second Party Congress. Um, and it's not clear to me what the, this is something I want to research more. Uh, I've, heard con, I've read conflicting accounts of what the Jewish Bund actually was requesting at the Party Congress. Um, one source says that they demanded um, to be the sole governing representative for all Jewish Russian Marxists. Um, and Lenin and Plekhanov and others uh, will not go along with this. And they feel like um, that they should not be setting uh, or um, allowing factions within the party. They want one party for one proletariat class and they don't want to start allowing exceptions for different ethnicities um, or different factions. And they feel that would be counterproductive. Um, and so the, the Jewish blood walks out. Um, <clears throat> and again, that could be another point of departure that we could discuss if we want to. Um, today we have, uh, think we refer to minoritarian politics or consensus building, um, anarchism versus communism, um, and degrees of autonomy within collective um, uh, bargaining congresses. So we can talk about all these things. Uh, and, and I feel like a lot of these, these events that occurred um, kind of, I think, laid groundwork for a lot of discussions that we're still having today in 2010. Um, he also, Lenin also talks about his book, What is to be Done, at the Second Party Congress. And this was the book that was the reading group discussion maybe two months ago, that Chris led. And um, he, uh, this is interesting to me, maybe you can like jump in here if you want to. Um, Lenin admits polemical excess in the book at the Second Party Congress. <laughs> and he explains it thus, he says, quote, nowadays all of us know the economists bent the stick in one direction. To straighten the stick out, it had to be bent in the opposite direction. This is what I did. And by the economists, he's kind of referring to the trade unionists and the syndicalists. Um, and so he, he does admit political excess and um, almost apologizes for it, but uh, actually explains where he's coming from and why they did that. Um, at this uh, party congress is the, f the famous formation of the Mensheviks and the Bolshevik factions. And I'll explain how that kind of happened and how that was also controversial for several reasons. Um, so Lenin feels, uh, Lenin feels like increasingly Plekhanov is just serving a role that is kind of a uh, figurehead role that he um, gives their proceedings like an air of a bona fide, um, you know, Plankinov agrees with it, then other Marxists can agree with it. But he feels like secretly Plankinov is really not making much of a contribution. Um, and so uh, he wants to oust Plankinov um, from uh, a central committee is formed and a, and a newspaper editorial board is formed. The newspaper is called the Discord. And Plekhanov and Lenin are on the editorial board, and they're in charge of um, disseminating uh, articles and propaganda throughout uh, the Russian Empire and throughout the immigre um, locales as well. And uh, Plekhanov and Lenin are continually fighting. And so, let me make sure I say this right. So Lenin has a friend named Martov, and they're both on the editorial board with Plekhanov. And Lenin comes to Martov. Uh, behind closed doors and he says, I would like to reduce the editorial board from six party members down to three. And then it would be me, you, and Plekhanov, and we can outvote Plekhanov whenever we uh, disagree with him. And at first, Martov is on board, and Lenin is going to make a motion for this at the Second Party Congress. Um, but uh, as the Party Congress uh, proceeds, 
Lennon and Bartop start disagreeing on specifically how party membership would be comprised. And, and then their disagreements grow from there. Um, Martov wanted a little more autonomy in party membership, and it had to do with um, the authority vested in party members, um, whether they had to, um, um, Lenin wanted every action done by a party member in the name of the party to be approved um, the, for there to be a chain of command. I think that's a simple way to say it. Martov also wanted this, but he wanted a looser chain of command, and he wanted a little more flexibility. Um, and the difference, actually, between the two probably might actually seem smaller to us than it seemed to them at the time, but they, um, they, their disagreements grow and grow and <clears throat> at the Second Party Congress, and Lenin um, has the majority of the supporters on his side, so he names those supporters the Bolsheviks, and that just means uh, majoritarians or the majority. And he uh, nicknames Martov's followers the Mensheviks, which just means the minority. And uh, Martov takes this name uh, and runs with it. Um, but Martov feels like he's been um, kind of bested at the Second Party Congress, and he realizes that he's in the minority. Um, And so after the Second Party Congress, <clears throat> a few months later, there's a Foreign League of Russian Revolutionary Social Democracy. There's the Foreign League of Russian Revolutionary Social Democracy. It's just three months after the Second Party Congress. It's the first time that everybody's met together after the walkouts, after the almost fist fight, after the schism between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. And by no means are any of these uh, disputes solved. And so it's kind of like round two. And uh, Martov, um, wants to uh, increase his upper hand at this, this meeting three months later. And so he gets up to the podium and he, he tells the story. Uh, he, he tells about the conversation that Lenin had with him privately about trying to reduce the editorial board from six members to three so they get out and vote Plekhanov. And people are aghast because, as I said, Plekhanov is this kind of sacred cow within uh, the Marxist movement. Um, let me just read this real fast. Because this is where Lenin falls out of favor, actually, it falls out and will become marginalized for about the next two years within the party. Uh, in the course of a lengthy speech, Martov revealed to uh, those assembled that Lenin was disingenuous in forming an alliance with Plekhanov. Before the Congress, Lenin had said to Martov, quote, don't you see that if you and I stick together, we'll keep Plankinov permanently in a minority, and there'll be nothing he'll be able to do about it, end quote. Uh, as Martov says this to the assemblage, uh, Lenin makes for the door, slamming it after him. Plankinov, who had been listening impassively, announced he was willing to step down in order to put an end to factional strife, following which uh, Lenin felt so disarmed by the events that he sent him in his own resignation. And so at this point, uh, Lenin is no longer in a, in a um, executive position within the party. And he, like I said, he'll be marginalized for the next almost two years. Um, but Lenin starts to regret his resignation. And he asks his friend Gleb, who has been elected to the Central Committee, to co-opt Lenin, a chair in the committee. And Gleb does, and the committee agrees to it. But um, this further um, divides the party, and Mensheviks are crying foul play, and they're saying that all of these positions were democratically elected at the Congress, except for Lenin now, who's asked to be given a chair after the fact, and is kind of appointed to the position. And so this also leads to Lenin. Uh, he does get the he does get the position, but he's 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 kind of marginalized during that time to um, uh, pamphlet writing, which actually. Uh, he writes some amazing things. But um, <clears throat> and the other reason that he's so out of favor at this point is because he called for the split between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. He um, set that in motion and named the two factions. And people are, are saying, um, 
you know, we're all committed to one part of the proletarian class, which is one class. And we let the Jewish Bund walk out, and we let the uh, workers' cause walk out because they wanted to have their own factions. And then um, Lenin goes and sets up his own factions. And so um, he's criticized heavily at this point. And he writes, <laughs> um, he writes uh, his next book after what is to be done is called One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. And he explains his version of events and critiques the Menshevik faction and the party at large. And then um, feels like he did a good job of defending himself. And this brings down more heat on him because people accuse him of, in, his, in the first book, What is to be done, of uh, arguing that party criticism is not to be allowed, but it's counterproductive. And then his next book, They Charge, is nothing but criticism of the party and of the Menshevik faction. So this further alienates him from even many of his supporters. Um, and if, either, if anybody who's read either of these wants to jump in on this afterwards, I would love that because I haven't read What Is To Be Done or One Step Forward, Two Steps Back yet. Well, for What Is To Be Done, he specifically uh, criticizes those who would criticize the party without being constructive towards the party. Like, people that just want to say, hey, these party policies are a joke, et cetera, et cetera, without being like, okay, here's what we should be doing instead of what we're doing now. Does that make a difference? If, if I can just add and, and clarify. Lenin is against what was at that time called, quote unquote, freedom of criticism, right? Um, and his point is this, if all you want is the ability to criticize, no one wants just the ability to criticize. What they want is they want a wrong policy to re be replaced with a right policy. So all of these people who are arguing for freedom of criticism aren't in fact arguing for any right policy, they're just criticizing in it essentially to wreck the party. Is that yeah. pretty much so? So that's it's, sort of it's the literally the first section of what is to be done. So, um, oh, the other thing I was going to mention is that when he sets up those party rules that he and um, Martov disagree on, um, he he's trying to set up party rules that will disallow uh, people who are not revolutionaries from joining the party and outvoting those who are revolutionary. And of course, so reminded of the of our own constitution that we have here for our group, and um, and you see, um, uh, I th almost all political groups do this as well. Even like Democrats and Republicans, they want to be able to form, um, or even the Black Panther Party or whoever it is, they want to be able to form their own policies for their own group and not have an influx. I mean, theoretically, we could have, um, you know, twenty college Republicans come in next week and, and vote for something. And so, and so it's a measure of, of self-control over the um, constitutional proceedings of your own group. And so that's how Lenin sees it um, with his uh, regulations for party membership. Um, so after the Congress, um, uh, I'm going to skip ahead here. There's the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. And um, all the problems throughout the empire are just exacerbated uh, through this war. Um, there's less resources to go around. Um, uh, anytime there's um, famines or droughts um, in the middle of a war, um, people are starving. And so um, the tide is turning ever more and more against the Romanov dynasty and against the, uh, the Tsar. Um, interestingly, just as a side note, Lenin argues during the Russo-Japanese War um, that uh, revolutionaries should not support uh, the uh, Russian dynasty, but uh, should not take sides against the Japanese. Um, and then this is a stand he'll also elaborate on in the Great War, World War I, where he feels like uh, the Russian Empire is um, imperialistic and that uh, it would be counter-revolutionary to support his own government in World War I. And he'll write a book called it's called like imperialism as the highest stage, stage of capitalism. Stage of capitalism, and, that, and so he argues against supporting um, the the Russian government in World War One. Um, uh, December of 1904, Lenin is uh, on a letter writing campaign, and he's networking as much as possible, and he's trying to convince the members of the Bureau of Committees of the majority that a reconciliation with the Mensheviks uh, is either A, impossible, or uh, B, anathema to revolutionary aims. 
However, he's outvoted. Uh, the Central Committee disagrees, and they set up plans for the Third Party Congress, and they're hoping to reconcile the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks. Um, then on January 9th, 1905, um, there's what is referred to as Bloody Sunday. And um, a large congregation of uh, Russian uh, Russians proceeded uh, down the main road uh, to the emperor's palace, and then included a lot of families, a lot of children, and at the head of it was uh, a lot of ecclesiastical leaders. And they were bearing a petition to the emperor and in their petition, they wanted um, universal civil rights and only a degree of democratic representation. They weren't even asking for universal suffrage, uh, but it, just like an elected body that would um, afford them a degree of democratic representation. And um, the crowd was fired upon, and there was a massacre, and public opinion further tips away from the ruling um, from, from the Tsar's dynasty. And um, Lenin is uh, out of, he's, he's not in Russia at the time, and so they're getting news, like they're getting piecemeal news, and it's really sketchy, and they're trying to, uh, they're trying to learn what is going on over there, and his initial reaction um, is to claim that now more than ever, the Bolsheviks need to oust the Mensheviks. Um, however, Lenin's uh, approach seems to change between December of 1904 uh, through January 1905, around the time of the Bloody Revolution. Uh, changes between then and April of 1905 when the Third Party Congress convenes. And Lenin has um, a new approach on several specifics. And uh, apparently it surprises a lot of people at the Congress because he hadn't been voicing this until he showed up at the Congress. Um, one of his is he wants more um, uh, land appropriation for the peasants. Uh, previously, he had been focusing primarily on gains for the industrial working class and had not been writing as much about uh, land appropriation. He had a small plan for a small uh, land appropriation, but he expands that after meeting um, the Christian uh, revolutionary Father Capon, and he uh, admires Father Capon, and they have conversations, and Lenin kind of changes some of his views and learns to respect um, uh, Christian revolutionaries a little bit more. Um, so the Third Party Congress opens up, and most of the party are trying to bridge the schism between Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. They think Lenin is going to be completely opposed to this. Um, many of the Mensheviks don't even show up. They have their own meeting in Geneva instead. Um, but Lenin, at this, at this party, makes some modifications. I mean, and, I'll talk about some of the rationale for why he may have made these and what the service thinks. Um, but he regains a lot of his former prestige at this, at this party congress that, he's, that he hasn't had for the last two years. Um, and there are three kind of possible reasons. Well, actually, I'll go over two because this is going on and on and on. Okay. Um, uh, one possible reason that Lenin may have changed um, his uh, proposals and his tactics and his emphases was um, just the sheer uh, disagreements that he was encountering from almost everyone, even Bolshevik supporters, on, on one particular or another, and the way that he had been marginalized within the party. And so it may be that he um, amends some of his proposals for that reason. Service kind of like um, almost unanimously thinks that Lenin just changes his his tactics, um, just to be politically expedient, <coughs> that uh, Lenin doesn't really have uh, a core set of values or objectives, um, that he, that, yeah, that it's um, basically one giant ego trip. Um, but, I, but I think in kind of reading some other sources, what actually happened was um, around the time of what is to be done, um, Lenin feels like we need to have a central party that will um, give instruction to the industrial class, and the industrial class will then give instruction to, actually I skipped this step, a central party that will give instruction to local party leaders. Local party leaders, leaders will give instruction to the industrial working class. The industrial working class will then um, be the kind of vanguard for the other um, sub-demographics in society, like the peasantry, uh, students, etc. Um, 
after being marginalized for so long, um, Lenin, Lenin changes some of this emphasis and wants a much greater um, role to be played by the industrial workers. And he wants um, them to be at the forefront of the vanguard. <clears throat> and of course, Service is skeptical of his motives. Um, but like I said, reading other sources, it seemed that what happened was uh, when Bloody <coughs> Sunday hit, um, public opinion shifted so much and um, organizations came out of the woodwork. Uh, anarchist organizations, communist organizations, agrarian socialist organizations, even liberal organizations, trade unions came out. Um, and, and Lenin was impressed by this. And he thought, he, he, seems, he said, I thought that um, the average industrial worker who was not educated, who may not know how to read very well, um, wasn't, uh, shouldn't be the vanguard of the party at that time, and shouldn't be making decisions unless they're unless the, the vanguard of the party educates them on theory. And he says, um, but after Bloody Sunday, he realized that there was a lot more potential for, um, for organization among the industrial working class um, already that he, he said he didn't see at the time. And so he, he argues for an increased role played by the industrial working class. And this kind of shocks everybody at the Third Party Congress. Um, at the Third Party Congress, delegates were also to remember years later, several people wrote memoirs that uh, when Lenin would go out to the pubs after, <coughs> after hours after the Congress and uh, have drinks with people, they all seemed to unanimously agree that he, um, at the time, told a lot of stories about the agrarian socialist terrorists and the practice of the Jacobins and the French Revolution as well, and that he was still very enamored by, the, by, that, by those policies, even though he kind of um, tried to keep a lid on that at times. Um, when he felt like other Marxists wouldn't appreciate that. Um, I have to bridge some of this. Uh, Lenin animates the audience of the third party with the following slogans, armed insurrection, a provisional revolutionary government, mass terror, the expropriation of gentry land. Um, he runs into some criticism for these inflammatory remarks, but by and large, he seems to capture the spirit of the times, um, according to the support he received. Um, he publishes his next book, Two Tactics of Russian Social Democracy and the Democratic Revolution, and he expounds on some of his changes and emphases and tactics from what is to be done. Um, he now thinks that the party was formerly too clandestine in their mechanisms. Um, he thinks that they were formerly too slow to set up trade unions and other organizations for the working class. And he writes of this new revolutionary moment that has changed uh, since Bloody Sunday. And then, this is really interesting too, um, service writes that what is to be done, this is going to service, and, um, what is to be done was a tract for its time and situation. Its universal theme was the need for leadership, which stayed constant throughout Lenin's writings, but it offered no permanent detailed prescription for the modalities of party organization. And so Service says that Lenin uh, has changed of those prescriptions for those modalities. Um, and this is another point of contention, or another point of disagreement between Service and I. Service constantly critiques Lenin for changing, for changing his uh, his opinions or his tactics. Uh, that would be something that I would praise Lenin for, actually, for being flexible and for changing, being willing to change his ideas as, as the moment changed and as the specific historical context change in which he was operating. Um, after Bloody Sunday, Soviets are formed, and these are small councils um, run by either peasants or industrial workers or people living in urban areas, they, they're setting up their own kind of collective councils for self-governance, um, and the Soviets take off. Um, Trotsky, who Trotsky and Lenin have, have just met at this time in their life, uh, and they become fast friends. Trotsky goes back to Russia to become deputy chair of one of the, of the Peters, Petersburg Soviet. Um, and then um, <coughs> service critiques Lenin for not also returning to Russia. He's invited by the party back to Russia, ever he's living abroad right now, and party leaders are asking him to come back. 
and he continually restates that um, you know as soon as he steps foot in Russia, he's just going to be arrested, which is uh, absolutely true. And so he uh, he says it's just it's just counterproductive uh, for him to come back. And so service, of course, like this is not being required. Lenin is not being really committed. Uh, but I didn't see it that way at all. Um, Finally, uh, the Tsar, bowing to public pressure, uh, issues a manifesto promising universal civil rights and to convoke a state of Duma. And Duma is just uh, their word for a legislative assembly there or a Congress. Um, he does, but with the provision that he can dissolve the Duma at any time. And so the Duma is formed, and the first Duma is, in fact, dissolved by the Tsar because he doesn't. Uh, because their, um, their motions don't meet with his approval. A second Duma is formed, and he dissolves the second. Um, and so Lenin uses this to point out that the, the belief in um, reform within the system, as opposed to revolution, is, is naive, uh, as these Dumas keep getting um, dissolved. Although, although Lenin does say that, we can, we, that working within the system for, um, for change and promoting revolution at the same time do not have to be mutually exclusive. And so he proposes that uh, party members run for office in the Duma while also at the same time promoting revolution. Um, maybe I'll leave it here, because this is the, the, the party is formed. They've had several congresses. I kind of touched upon the, the factions between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks. Um, how does the story end? How does the story end? Um, Titanic sinks. <laughs> Jesus is crucified. Um, well, so they've had several congresses. Um, there's a lot of mass movement in the streets that kind of flares up and dies down over the next um, eight or nine years. Um, all party members continue to work. Um, uh, Lenin is putting in long, long days. His doctors are asking him to curtail his, his, um, his involvement because he continues to have these nervous breakdowns, um, but he doesn't. Um, so over the next several years, they, they continue to try to work within the Duma as much as possible. They continue to try and promote revolution. Um, spontaneous revolution is flaring up in the streets, and um, and then World War One happens. So um, things for a small time take a back seat, and then they flare up all of a sudden, um, and the uh, Romanov dynasty is overthrown during World War One, and the uh, party believes it's their duty to disengage from involvement in World War One. that it's an imperialist war and that people are dying for no reason. And so eventually they do just that. But you want to take, take a look from here? Because I, correct me if I'm wrong, I would imagine Leninism will include, will cover mostly from there well, on, right? Well, this, this is actually a theory lecture, but if you want I can talk about that as well. I would love and if you guys want to, if you have any questions, or we could even wait to do questions until after Greg's done talking, since we're both speaking on Lenin in various forms, and then you can ask us both questions if you have any. If that's all right with you, Greg. Right? I'm. You're the you're the main show, so whatever's fine. Let's do that. Do we want to change the battery? Yeah. All right.